Today we are going to be talking about zebra mussels and the distribution and abundance in Lake Erie and the St. Lawrence River. Discovered in Lake St. Clair in 1988, marked with the red dot there, was thought that the invasive species was brought into the country from ballast of large cargo ships releasing fresh water contaminated with free swimming larvae. Within a few years, spread through all the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River. Zebra mussels are filter feeders and adult mussels have the ability to filter up up to one liter of water per day per mussel. Although they can reduce the toxicity of water, the ecosystem is greatly affected by filtering of algae and plankton which reduces the amount of food for native species. This also causes sunlight to penetrate to deeper depths which creates an explosion of plant life altering the physical characteristics under the water. The mussel's ideal living conditions are at a temperature between 6 to 28 degrees Celsius in free flowing water of 6 feet per second that allow an abundance of plankton to float by. They typically live on hard surfaces such as rocks and other hard shelled native bivalves. They can be found at any depth but their highest densities are found at a range of 6 to 45 feet and a calcium level of more than 20 parts per million is necessary in order to survive. The zebra mussel needs an alkaline environment as well with a pH of 7.2 to 9.0. They do best in water where there is abundance of hard substrate but they can proliferate in soft sediments. They like fresh water environments with a salinity level of less than 4 parts per thousand. The lifespan of a nuisance species is about 3 years and typical female can produce up around 30 to 40,000 eggs. This graphic will show the different stages of life from larvae to mature adult. So here we have the adult male, which reproduce with the egg and sperm. And it goes to the trochophore stage, straight hinged, a bono, petty villager, to settled juvenile, to a full juvenile, and the life cycle starts over. The comparison and distribution of zebra mussels in laminar and turbulent flowing waters will be discussed with the information gathered from scholarship articles. In all the Great Lakes, zebra mussels in particular are in the lake are changing at various rates. Even though zebra mussels are still in abundance, they are being taken over by quagga mussels, reaching high abundances found in the near shore regions and are also starting to be found in deeper water offshore areas. Lake Erie 2002 was the last wide survey that has been done. Abundance means have not changed very much since 1992. In 1992, abundant means change was from 2,636 meters squared to 2,025 meters squared in 2002. Bio, but biomass means rose fourfold, from 1992 at 6.8 grams meters squared to 24.7 grams meters squared in 2002, where in the eastern basin is where most Dresdenet biomass occurs at a high percentage. Populations in the western basins are minimal due to poor food conditions. Populations in the central basin are scarce from the change in oxygen from the different seasonal changes. With no clear trends from surveys done in the past in the western basin, does it indicate population fluctuation? Quagga mussels have not replaced zebra mussels as dominant species. Zebra mussels are changing the character characteristics of not only Lake Erie, but also the Great Lakes ecosystem by altering the energy and nutrient cycle. With the negative impact on fish and native species of invertebrates from the development of Bethnic algae and alga blooms being a nuisance. Ideally, certain recordings reported would be that of zebra mussels abundances of size frequency distributions weight, length, and biomass. Length and weight would be essential for the most methodical resolu resolution of biomass, which would provide a foundation for gauging the relative status of populations and individuals, respectively. 
Plaga and zebra mussels abundancy should be reported as a minimum indicator. Zebra and quagga mussels trend can be altogether different with environmental conditions. In many of the offshore regions, zebra and quagga mussels populations are directly in various stages of change. Some shore regions population seems to be firm and declining, but others are on the rise. This would be an indicator to determine the abundance biomass population with the neighboring environment to become stable and at an equilibrium. Here is a chart showing a percentage of sites with Drosenza and mean abundance of Drosenza in numbers per square meters from 1991 to 2010. Zebra mussels at around 98% and quaggas at around 9% in 1991 and then started to get closer to each other percentage. And then in 2009, quaggas mussels started to rise over the zebra mussels. Now here is a chart showing the means and density of zebra and quagga mussels from 1991 to 2010 by meters squared. Zebra mussels above 22,000 and dropping in the year 2004, where the quagga mussels started to rise, now showing quagga mussels higher at 1,400 in 2007. And now I will turn it over to Paul. Okay, uh, in 2003, there was a case study done for St. Lawrence River. It was titled, Influence of Physiochemical Factors on the Distribution and Biomass of Invasive Muscles. Uh, as I said, it was done in 2003, from mid-July to early September. 20 sample sites were taken along the St. Lawrence River, and sampling depths range from 0.6 to 8.8 .8 meters in depth. Samples were also taken to capture the variability in calcium. A distinct calcium change occurs along the southwest shore of the island of Montreal, which is seen by the red dot in the map. Uh, where humic water, humic is uh, kind of an acidy water from biodegradation, de uh, meets the alkaline, alkaline water of the St. Lawrence, creating a higher calcium content. St. Lawrence River is still the only large North American river invaded by both zebra and quagga mussels. Okay, I'm just going to throw on a little video here while I discuss what their findings were. This is uh, the spread of zebra mussels through North America, obviously pretty much just America, starting in 1987. Okay, so their findings for uh, St. Lawrence River was, zebra mussel populations occurred at calcium levels as low as 8 milligrams per liter, but quagga mussels were absent below 12 milligrams of calcium per liter. It's just suggesting that they have high, uh, higher calcium requirements. Both species increase in biomass with increasing substrate size but displayed contrasting patterns with depth. Calcium concentrations would predict the occurrence but not the abundance of zebra and quagga mussels. Substrate, substrate size would have no significance or influence on the zebra or the quagga mussels biomass. And zebra mussels biomass would be greatest in shallow waters while quagga mussel biomass was greatest in deeper waters. Okay, back into this thing here. Calcium. Now this was their findings and what you're seeing is uh, red is higher biomass, yellow is moderate biomass, green is low biomass. Now we'll go up to the top here and, and where it says one and two. There was a high abundance of the quagga mussels. Uh, that, that had to do with uh, the depth. There was a, uh, a deeper depth, shall we say, at the number one location, and then it shallowed out. So therefore, you were you had a higher concentration of zebra mussels. Uh, number three is green, which means that they had low biomass. Uh, again, it was deeper, but for some, so therefore, zebra mussels weren't able to um, produce or survive in that area. So quagga mussels came in, but again, that's a smaller area. And then as you go down to, say, areas, as you can see, we'll follow it down six and seven, 
uh, very, very low, and now you're seeing that that might have something to do with uh, current, uh, giving, not the giving them a good place to rest. It just kind of pushes them along. And then uh, where you see Ottawa River there, that's where the two waters meet, as in the Hummus River from Ottawa and the Alkaline uh, Waters from St. Lawrence. And in the little bay of Lake St. Louis, the, the two gather together and create large, large calcium concentrations, which is why you see 17, 18, and 19, you have huge biomass numbers in that area. But again, I'd like to iterate that a lot of it has to do with uh, their findings were that depth and uh, calcium concentration pretty much dictated the abundance of the invasive species. In the 20 years since zebra mussels first appeared in North America, they have become one of our most widespread and abundant freshwater animals and have fundamentally transformed freshwater food webs and biochemistry. Indeed, few human impacts in North American freshwater have, have been greater or more far-reaching than arrival of this single species. Nevertheless, ecological research has been uneven and important research questions remain unanswered, especially concerning the long-term, large-scale effects of the invasion. Economic impacts have also been incompletely estimated, although they already exceed 100 million. We know little about the extent to which large outreach programs about zebra mussels have changed public knowledge, attitudes, or behaviors, and there is still a substantial gap in policies to curb the establishment, spread, and impacts of species like zebra mussels. Scientific educational policy responses to zebra mussel invasion highlight our successes and limitations concerning alien species in general. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>